Thank you for being with us today. We would love to have you join us in person. To partner with us or to give online, go to www.upperroomohio.com. We hope you enjoy this message. Hey, we've been in this awesome series, and uh, I had to get my iPad some juice, and I forgot it. But we've been in this awesome series called uh, His Presence Transforms. His Presence Transforms blank, and we've went through each of these banners, and uh, we started with mindsets, we went through marriages, we've been through circumstances, cities, nations, and then people. Uh, Last week, Matt, my brother, how many liked his passion? He is a passionate guy. He, uh, he's passionate with anything he does, and, uh, and I was a little nervous. I listened to him, and I was a little nervous going into this. I was like, so Matt, what are you preaching on? And he's like, I don't know, man. I, and he started telling me little things. I was like, man, it sounds pretty political. How's that tie into his presence, you know, and some things. But I enjoyed listening to it. I enjoyed his passion. And uh, so, and I agree. I agree that we have, we, the church, we, the people have a voice and we have a responsibility. People fought for us to have a right to vote. People have fought and lost their lives so that we can have a say-so, whatever that might be. So there's some voter guides out on the welcome desk. You're welcome to get those. But here's, here's what I always encourage. Vote prayerfully and with wisdom. Seek the Lord and who, who you vote for and what issues. And, uh, but how many believe this? And then we can all agree on this, that the answer to the problems in this country isn't government, isn't a system, isn't a party, but how many believe it's Jesus? Jesus is the greatest solution. Jesus is the answer. And uh, we do believe that people are used by Jesus to, to bring change, to bring transformation, and to bring his glory, to bring his gospel forward. So, um, so that's how you need to vote. But uh, we're going to continue this week, and I'm going to move into uh, His Presence Transforms Families. And, um, and we've been in this, this fun thing. Honestly, like, I should have split this one into two weeks. And I, sh- I, I kind of thought, well, we'll just end it today. But I don't know. Um, I, I feel like families is, is two-part. And uh, I'm going to do it as one for now, but we'll see. I, I once did a series 12 weeks on family. Family is. And um, Nicole finished that up one week. as well, what family isn't. And that, that was really fun. But I believe that, that kingdom grows in the soil of relationships. I believe family is the government of heaven. I believe that heaven looks like family. I believe that there's all these creatures and beings and people that are all there unified as one body, one bride, glorifying, celebrating Jesus for eternity, day and night, 24-7. And it looks like a family, and God's family is beautiful, and God is love, and God's family is love. And, and so I just felt like there's this thing, but family is in the context of blood family, but it's also in the context of church family, community. And, and we, we call things, because family, family isn't, you know, home, home itself isn't a destination. It's not a place. See, home, home is, is an environment that we all get to co- create, that we get to live in of joy, of peace, of unity, of these things. So, so that's also with family. Like, family means that we all contribute. I, I love that I'm not alone. I would not be good alone, all right? I get bored. I like to talk. I like to be around people more so than anything. I like to listen. It's funny. You see me up here, and if you interact with me in group settings, I'm a talker. But then one-on-one, I just, I love to sit and listen. I'm more of an introvert than I am an extrovert, actually. And, and, and here's the thing, like on car rides, I just love to listen. Now, Nicole loves me to talk, but I love to listen. And that's the thing, we all get to engage in this, and that's what family is. Everybody has, has a spot at this table. Everybody has a seat at this table called family, called life, called kingdom, called Christianity, called your home, whatever that is. And, and, and so today, I really want to go through it, and we're going to really be, be di- dissecting and, and talking about Romans 12, and where Paul really um, gives us clarity on what a family should look like. And I gave you some homework a while ago, and, and this homework included, look at 1 Corinthians 13. This was on His Presence Transforms Marriages. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's definition of love, not as a definition, not as information, but actually a challenge to live by. And that's the same thing we're going to do today is like, let's actually operate in the context of our communities, whether that be your workplace, your home, your church, in the context of Romans 12. 
So before we get there, let me, let me just talk about some things. Like family is so important to God, and, and the kingdom is family. And, and I always say a few things here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you those. But if family is the government of heaven and love is the currency, then the economy must be relationships, and the kingdom is a family business. I'm just going to spew out some quotes that I, that I love to do. My definition of family is it's the functioning unit. It's the organized functioning unit of love. For me, that's what family is. It's the organized functioning unit of love. And, and let me say that love looks different. Love looks like something. Love sometimes looks messy. Love looks like sometimes peace. And love looks like unity at times. But sometimes love looks messy. And, and let me just tell you, like, sometimes this costs you something. Like, it costs something to be in a family. It, it costs something to, to give yourself to, to one another. It costs yourself to be in a marriage and actually to dive in to say, you know what, we're going to be covenant. It doesn't mean we always agree. And, and for me, a lot of the times, the, the family is, is unity. And that's, that's the important value that I have is that we don't all agree. We don't all look and act and feel the same, but we have unity. My wife and I, we were driving down the street, and, and we were driving, and, and all of a sudden we saw this neighborhood, and these houses were super close together, and they were all almost the same color, and all looked identical, all two-story straight square boxes, all vinyl siding within a relative color of each other, and uh, like it was like 50 shades of gray, <laughs> and, and, and we look at that, I'm like, man, that's really boring, and, and I, want, I love living in a neighborhood where I get to be different, I get to stand out. You know, I want my house to be different. I want my creativity to be different. I want my car to be different. I love doing things that nobody else does. I love, I love being adventurous, and I love trying to do the abnormal. Now, maybe some of you, you just like the normal, and you want it all to be the same, and it helps you. It gives you peace at night to sleep that all these houses look the same. But see, unity is not trying to make everybody be the same. Unity is taking everybody who's different, like a church like this or like your family, and saying, okay, now we're going to come together and actually have unity. My, my kids, they're all totally different, and not one of them wants to be a firefighter or pastor. I got one that wants to be a doctor, one that wants to be a teacher, one that wants to be an artist. I've got one that wants to be a mom. And it's like our daughters, the four girls we have, like, not one of them said, like, but, but me, if, if it was all about me, I'd be like, no, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to do this. Listen, that's not, that's not unity. That's conformity. That's control. That, that's manipulation even at times. It's like, but when we bring everybody around this table, and, and like I've said before, Nicole, our first service was talking about a table. Like, imagine the importance of table. And, and, and let me just say this, like God uses the table so often to transform people, to transform nations, to transform relationships. He uses the dinner table to unite a husband and wife before they're ever married. Many times a date starts by going out to dinner with one another. It's that table. It's coffee with somebody, getting to know them. Jesus, you know, it was a table that, that helped transform Daniel. It was a table that helped transform the Queen of Sheba, like this is, these are the things. And then even in Psalms 23, he says he's, pre he's prepared a table before us in the presence of who? Our enemies. He broke bread at the table. He took the disciples, and he's, he's having this heart moment with them saying, listen, I'm leaving, but somebody who's greater than me is coming. Go wait with anticipation, expectancy, because my spirit's going to be poured out. And, and this is what, what's happened. And then you go back to even the tabernacle, and there was the table of showbread. Another word for showbread would be the bread of his presence. So here, every week, the high priest would change out that bread and put fresh bread out at the table of showbread. Why? Because they wanted fresh encounters with God, and they wanted to host his presence well. His presence transforms us. His presence transforms marriages. His presence transforms systems. His presence transforms leaders. His presence transforms families. I don't know what you came in here with. I don't know if you have relationships that are distant or, or maybe there's unforgiveness or bitterness or maybe there's a divorce you've had to walk out and there's still issues or like just something there. Or maybe there, you just want to be closer to your kids or maybe you want to be closer to your church family. Like his presence transforms us. I love Nick and Tina. We've done a lot of marriage uh, courses with them and like we tend to, some of our friends, they tend to be the guinea pigs of the new things we want to try in the church. So the ones we're closest to are like, let's just try it in our home group. 
So we've tried this a lot, and I love Nick and Tiana. One of the one things we did, we first started this marriage ministry called Dynamic Marriage. And, and they're like, listen, and I remember them getting up in front of the class why they're there. And we had people there like, well, if, if God doesn't intervene, we're considering divorce. We had people there like, hey, we just want to start off on a good foot. We're getting married in six months. Um, and then Nick and Tiana stand up, and they're like, listen, our marriage is really great, but great can always be better. Like, I just remember that it stuck out to me. Like, we're in love with each other, but it can always be better, and we want the more. So maybe that's just you today. Like, you just want the more. You have this amazing family and this amazing thing, but better, good, can always be better. And that's where I am. I want to hunger for the more. I want to be so humble that I'm always hungering for the more. So in family, in the context of family, God transforms so many families in the Bible, and he has this emphasis on family. It began with a family in a garden, and it ends with a family with a bride and groom being connected forever with a family in heaven. And anything in between, we see Job, he lost his family and it was restored twofold. We see where Acts 2, the church became a family. Like, and it's an amazing thing. And, and, and I just want to reiterate the point. It goes through that, that, at the end of Acts 2, it's going through these things of like, they came together. Listen, his presence came. It swept through the room like a mighty rushing wind, like a tornado is what that translates to. Flames sat on their heads, and then they began to speak in other tongues where they all understood what was happening. And then it says they lived with gladness and generosity. They came together in community. They experienced signs and wonders, right? These are all the things and the the benefits of, of family. When they were in one mind and one accord. They came together, they sold everything they had, they came together in unity, and boom, bah, 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 this happens. And one of the things at the end of the chapter, it says, it says they broke bread and they met daily in the tabernacle and house to house. God is not just concerned about our ministries and our churches, he's concerned about your families. He's concerned about, about your homes, he's concerned about your marriages, he doesn't want just good, he wants great He doesn't want just a survival of a statistic. He wants you to live heaven on earth. That's the thing. And then at the end of that, after it says they they met daily house to house and in the temple, it says then thousands were added to them daily. That's Acts 2. We fast forward years later. Sometime later, Acts 5, the end of Acts 5, it says they continually met in the temple daily and house to house. Listen, it's not just about the family of doing church and ministry together. We also get to do life together. Let me just say this in a different way. My, my heart is that I get to experience revival personally, and then I get to exploit it outside of there. I, I came to this conclusion a long time ago. I couldn't just desire revival in my church and not walk the walk and live it. So, so my goal is not to try to impress you with good words and rhetoric and try to convince you I'm right. My, my, my goal is not to try to grow a ministry. My goal is not to have another good program My goal is to literally host the presence of Jesus in my heart. That's my life song, to host his presence, to love Jesus well. And then that allows me to love my wife well, to love my family well, to then love a church well, love a community well. It all starts right here with me. Then it goes and bubbles into my marriage, and as we host his presence well in our marriage, then our home, our kids benefit from that. Our home gets to walk in the fullness of God's presence. Then it trickles out from there to the church, to the community, to the state, to the nation, to the nations. That's me. My goal isn't to try to reach the nations. My goal is to host his presence and worship the King of Kings. In that, then he's glorified, and he makes a way. He opens the doors. He closes the wrong ones. Like, it's this beautiful thing. My goal is not to just, oh, bless marriages. No, I'm going to host his presence. About a year ago, we talked about Obed-Edom. And it says in Obed-Edom in 2 Samuel, it's, they're looking for a place for the Ark of the Covenant. And it goes to Obed-Edom's house. And in 2 Samuel 6, he talks about he hosted the presence, the Ark of the Covenant, which also is the presence. It re- represents, it's symbolic for the presence of God. He hosts the Ark, Ark of the Covenant for three months. And it says his whole household was blessed. What does that look like for us to say we're going to host his presence for three months? We're going to host his presence. We're going, to, we're going to worship more than we're going to watch TV. We're going to read our word before we watch that movie. And I'm not saying any of that stuff's wrong. It's just Jesus first. That's it. I'm not saying TV's wrong. I love watching the Buckeyes. I love watching them beat Nebraska. It's messing with you. I, 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 love, I love these things. I love hunting. I love fun. I love adventure. 
But more than anything, I love Jesus. More than anything, Jesus first. So what does it look like to host his presence and then my whole household is, is transformed? Why? Because his presence is what transforms. So we, we get into the word to the Israelites. We see how a nation was literally transformed in his presence and became a family. A nation that were slaves and then became a family for the promised land. And Joshua says this. He says, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Maybe that's the key to the promised land. Just taking a stand and put a stake in the ground and say, as for me and my house, as for me and my family, as for me and those around me, as for me and the ones I'm responsible for, we're going to serve the Lord. And boom, the promised land opens up, whatever that is for you. So they're Israelites, they're coming out of slavery. At times, there's this dysfunction. They're mad at each other. They are so angry with Moses. And they're bitter, and they're at times even saying, if we can just go back to Egypt and slavery, at least we know where we have a bed and we have food and we can eat. At least we know where our meals are come from. And then all of a sudden, they just keep pushing forward into this journey, into this adventure, into this thing called life, into this thing called family, into this thing called covenant. And then pretty soon, it goes from looking back and always wanting to go back to, okay, now we're looking forward. And then it comes to Joshua, and Joshua, the one who says, as for me and my house, will serve the Lord. They come to this river, and he says, listen, your grandpas and your dads were circumcised, but you haven't been circumcised. This might cost you something, but I need to make sure you're all in. And they took dull flint stones, and they circumcised the men of that generation who hadn't been circumcised. And then they crossed over to get to the promised land. This is sometimes covenant, sometimes family. It costs you something, but there's a promised land on the other side that's totally worth it. The Bible talks about whole house salvation. Jesus himself, he moved in the temples, and 50% of his miracles were in the synagogues, were in the temples, were in the church, which means 50% were out of the church. So he visited homes and visited houses, and then we know that it was in the temple daily and house to house. But in Acts, there's there's two examples where where in Acts, around the sixth chapter, he's, he's saying to Cornelius, God's got this promise to Cornelius, you and your whole household will be saved. Whole house salvation, like... But here's the thing, it's a Greek word for saved there is sozo that Nicole was talking about, which translates to saved, healed, and delivered. Again... The jailer, in in a few chapters later in Acts, the jailer's asking Paul and Silas. They're in prison. And a jailer's asking them about salvation. You know what they say? The promise is yours and your entire household will be saved. Isn't that amazing? But here's the Greek word again, sozo. Like God is more concerned than just your salvation. Like, Like he's more concerned than just getting you to heaven. He wants to get heaven into your home. Like, Jesus moved in the church, and he moved in the houses. And let me tell you today, he still wants to do the same. Jesus wants to sweep and move through our churches, and he wants to move through our homes, and he wants to move through our marriages, and he wants to move through our workplaces. Like, God wants to rule and reign and love on his people. This is who God is. So we're talking about whole house salvation, but we're also, we're, we're talking not just the, the, the heaven ticket, we're talking about the fullness of life abundantly here on earth, John 10.10. 10. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. In Matthew, Jesus references that a house divided can't stand. And John 10.10 10 says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to divide and take you off course. But my favorite part, but Jesus came to give life and what? Life abundantly. It's this amazing thing of like, he doesn't want you just to make it into heaven. He wants you to have heaven life here. I guess this beautiful picture. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in where? As it is in heaven. So he wants heaven to rule and reign here on earth too. Why? Because he loves his sons and daughters who know their sons and daughters. So let's get into Romans 12 here. Before we get there, Daniel 4.3 says this. It says that how great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom from generation to generation. It's this beautiful thing. Like God is concerned not just with you but your kids, your kids' kids, your kids' 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 kids, your future kids, your future spouse. Like God loves you. He loves your family. He loves you. He loves your relationships. He wants reconciliation. He wants peace to rule and reign in everything that you're in. 
So Paul, we get to Romans 12 here, and, and many say, theologians say, that, that Romans could really be divided into two parts. And if it were, chapters 1 through 11 would be Paul's doctrine and theology. And then 12 on would be basically the application of that. So here he's about 19 to 20 years into ministry when he writes uh, this letter to the, to the church in Rome. And he had not yet visited there, but this is coming from a mature Paul. He had already planted several churches. He's getting ready to approach his third missionary trip. And this is, this is the journey of Paul. And he's writing this letter to the church of Rome that he's not yet visited, but he's coming from a place of experience, maturity. And he's like, okay, finally, this, this, is, this is it. Like, this is the way to do it. And, and we get to this place, and, and it's this beautiful picture. And, and, and I was at Chloe's chapel. She goes to Troy Christian. We, we went to her chapel on Friday. And they read this, and I was like, I got most of my notes. I was like, yeah, I'm including that. That's good stuff. So Friday morning, that just that hits me in this, this chapel service. And I'm like, man, that is family. That is family in the context of your home and also in the context of this home. Like, this is family. So it starts off in... And, and it's funny because we're talking about sometimes family costs you something. Sometimes it's messy. I want to share a story, but it's from the context of, and by the way, the first message I spoke on this series was from Romans 12.2. And I want to just, it was fitting just to kind of go from that place, that we're renewed. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind. Like when God transforms our thinking and his presence invades our thinking, then our outlook changes and our actions are there to follow. So let me just tell you, and then it talks about in the very beginning of that chapter 2 before what we're going to read. It says, present yourself, beseech you therefore, brethren, present yourself a living sacrifice. Sometimes family takes a little bit of sacrifice. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes it's ugly. Ah. Sometimes marriage is ugly. Sometimes it's messy. Listen, it's not easy taking people, putting them together, putting them in one house and say, now you're married. Like, that's not easy. Like, Nicole squeezes that toothpaste. That drives me nuts. She's a toilet paper down from the roll kind of person. Who does that? There's a reason every hotel out there goes over the roll, okay? That means they know it's right. The Ritz-Carlton has this thing right, and it's over the roll. There's these things that's messy. Well, let me tell you a messy story before we get into this. Um, my, my mom, as you know, we, we celebrate my mom and dad as the founders of this church. And, uh, and those of you who know our journey, now we have this beautiful person in our life named Patty, who's my, my dad's wife, my stepmom, grandmother to our children, and she's just really amazing. But it wasn't always that way. And she'll be the first to tell you, it was messy, it was ugly. My mom died six years ago, about two months before we opened up the doors of this building here. And so we're in this transition, we're in this growth and explosion, and, and just me, myself, I'm managing the construction project, I'm doing the budget for the church, still pastoring the youth, assistant pastoring as well, full-time firefighter, just had our third baby, mom dies. So we're getting through that, we're hurt, we're traumatized, it's trauma because we're a church that believes in healing, and yet the pastor's wife wasn't healed, why, why does they heal that cancer and not this one? So we're processing, we're hurting, you know. And then like four months after my mom dies, my dad says, well, I'm going to marry a woman. A woman you've never met. We're like, what? And, and what's crazy is some family in the church who really loved my dad thought it would be great to, fit, to hook him up on a blind date because um, Patty lost her husband to cancer as well and just thought there was a good connection there. And, and obviously there was. Seven months later after my mom's death, they get married. Now, now in this in this window of opportunity, my sisters, if you know my sister Leah and Cheryl, they are crazy. <laughs> like, I mean that in a fun, good way, but I also mean that like in a literal way. They're crazy. <laughs> like, that's right. We're just going to talk them out while they're gone in Atlanta behind their backs. <laughs> they can't defend themselves, so now's the perfect time. But they're, they're literally crazy. So they're doing background checks, online background checks on Patty, all right? They are like Facebook stalking and doing all these things. They know her financial status. They know her marriage status. They know everything. So one day it got to this point to where, like, there's hurt. You know, obviously they just were struggling with change. That's really, they were still hurting from mom's death, struggling with change. Um, my dad, let me just tell you this about my dad. You're just really not going to tell him what to do. And the more you try to tell him what to do, the more he just don't do it. 
So, so this was not a good combination. So our family's falling apart. At one point, I remember trying to mow the grass. I'm on the phone with my sister in the shed. And Cheryl's like, I'm disowning him. I'm disowning my dad. And I was like, Cheryl. Now, I'm the youngest sibling by seven years of all of them. And me and Matt are like cool, calm, collected. And I'm saying things like, if dad's happy, we're happy. We're not going home to an empty house. He is. You know, trying to defend him and trying to protect the family. And so, so at one point, I'm like, Cheryl, God never, dad, dad never turned his back on you. He never, he never gave you up when you made mistakes. We can't do this now. Leah's calling me crying. Can you believe this? Can you believe, you know, we not even met this woman. Who, how do we even know who she, how's he know who she is? You know, all this stuff, right? And, and, and basically, here's what it boiled down to. I had to fight. First off, the church is opening and growing. I'm fighting to keep this thing afloat. I'm fighting to keep my family together. I'm kind of like the David, the youngest of the family, fighting to keep the family together. I'm the Joseph, like, come on, let's just all get along, guys. But then it got very traumatic and it got very hard. And Patty's coming into some of these counseling meetings. We brought a pastor in to kind of help us navigate through some of this and the direction of the church and different things. And, like, there's very hurtful meetings. And, and like, Patty, like, we're saying, Patty, you even know what you're getting into? And she's, like, frantic, like, I don't know. <laughs> and then we adopted this phrase, and it was unity at all costs. Our family, like, the enemy's trying to divide our church. It was trying to divide our family. We have this beautiful woman coming into our life, but we didn't know that yet. You know, we know that now. A, a, an amazing thing that we now know. But back then, you know, you just don't know that, and you're just changed. Ooh, I hurt. Ah, <laughs> And we just adopted this phrase because our family was literally falling apart. My sister wanted to disown my dad, you know. <laughs> it's not something light. And we just adopted this phrase that we heard, unity at all costs. And we started saying that and we started talking about that on the phone. When we'd start to kind of turn against my dad or Patty or whatever, I'd just remind him, unity at all costs. And it means we have a meeting, we disagree. We have these conversations, we disagree. But when we hang up that phone or we walk out of that meeting, we're in agreement and we have unity. Like, unity will cost. And then we started saying, well, listen, then we got to a point of, like, healed. And we got to a point where we started to embrace Patty. And we started to see the value of her and, and the value of her in my dad's life. May have saved my dad's life. He was not going down a good path. He was pretty depressed and, and just kind of went AWOL for a while. You know, he was traveling and doing things. But he was emotionally AWOL. And then Patty comes in and revives that. And, and here's the thing, we started to realize, like, then a while later, after things came back together, they started to divide again. So then we adopted another phrase, we had to fight to get unity, now we got to fight to keep unity. And that's the beautiful thing about family. We may not all agree, we may not all agree on everything, we may not all like what our sibling thinks about something, but it's unity at all costs, and it costs you something, and it's hard, and it's messy, so we get to this place in Romans 12, in verse 3, it says, For the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. I love one version. It says, Think of everybody else as better than you. You ever arrogant? You need some hum humility? Read that one. Think of everybody else as better than you. <laughs> It's like, your way's not always the right way. You're not always the best. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individual members, one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And then it goes through the list of the, 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 the offices of ministry. And it talks about prophecy. It talks about the, the ministry of service. It talks about teachers, the, the exhorter, or the one who encourages. And then it talks about generosity. And it says the one who leads with zeal and the one who acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So it goes through this list. And for the sake of time, I'm going to paraphrase those. But, but here's the deal. It's saying, although you're all different, although there's, there's, one, there's still one body, like, you may all be different. You may all bring something different to this table. But thank God we did because now this is an amazing potluck. Like, this is an amazing feast now because we all brought something different. If we all looked and acted and was the same, it would be a very, very boring universe. Let, let, me, let me just bring this home and then we'll move on. My daughters. We, we bought this house in 1840. I wrote a poem about it. I'll read it sometime. I was in a tree stand hunting barren elk. Again, two years later from last time, 
and I spent five more days in a tree stand not seeing a single animal. It was amazing. So day three, I started to get a little senile, and I started writing poetry. <laughs> I wrote five poems, right, Jay? We, we, maybe we have a collaborative work to do, okay? Mine are really long, so I, I, I wrote one called 1840. Let's just read it. Would you like to hear my poem? It's a rabbit trail, but it might be worth it to you. Here we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. Are you ready? We bought a, it's called 1840. We bought a house built in 1840. It even came with 16 silkies. That, remind me, that's the story I'm going to go with, silkies. Okay, they're chickens. We bought a house built in 1840. It even came with 16 silkies. Oh, how excited we were for this adventure until we realized it was really just torture. From killing mosquitoes, snakes, moles, coons, and mice, to exposing everything and nothing seemed nice. What we hoped was a dream come true has so far turned out to be very blue. Wallpaper, wallpaper, and wallpaper some more. Cover that crap with shiplap for sure. <laughs> Expose that brick, replace that floor. Oh, crap, now we're over budget, 4,004. <laughs> nothing has been easy or quite a thrill, but all feels better when we just yell out with thrill. We are trusting God through this process, but dang, enough is enough. Just get us our appliances. We ordered them August 30th. Still don't have them. Nothing has been more real except how we're becoming more vulnerable. Faith, trusting, leaning, and humble. Please, Nicole, don't take another tumble. Stairs, chickens, trees, and more to get used to is part of our crazy story. In the end, we know that God will get the glory. From deer to land to creek and pool, our family legacy continues on from 1842. That's my poem. How about you say we get back on track? So, the one body, many parts. We have four daughters. Three can handle the level of responsibility of taking care of chickens. The just now turned four-year-old cannot yet. Okay, she, she, you should see her carry around our new kitten. Like yesterday, she's carrying it by the neck, walking around like this. I was like, hey, you might not want to do that. So, so anyway, we have three daughters. They're all completely, we have four, but three, they're all completely different personalities. So there's three duties with chickens, we find out. Letting them out in the morning to, to eat in the pen, feeding them at some point, and then putting them back in the, 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 the chicken coop, all right? So we have three girls that can handle that responsibility, and we have three completely different personalities. But they all make something work. So we go with Chloe. Chloe is not a morning person, and she's super grumpy when she gets off the school bus, all right? So, Chloe, guess what? You're putting the chickens in at night, okay? Now we go to Evelyn. Now, Evelyn is, is very, very, very slow in the morning, and we got to kind of put jumper cables on her to kickstart her to get her going, but uh, she's also not so active at night. So guess what? Evelyn's feeding the chickens after she gets off the school bus. Then we get to Olivia. Olivia is this bebop, happy, first one out of bed in the morning, always happy, excited, first one dressed in the morning. So what do you think Ev Olivia does? She lets them out. So it's this beautiful thing for the greater good that the chickens don't die. Fifteen little fun hens and one rooster, and we have this one hen. She's mean. She doesn't like the girls, and they don't like her. It's not the rooster. The rooster's fine. It's this hen. And she sits on her eggs, and she will not get off those eggs. So they, they, have to team, they have to team approach that one. And one of them goes up and grabs the chicken, gets over it, and then the other ones are taking all the eggs because it's been like three weeks since they've collected those eggs. It's like they're afraid of her. I'm like, come on, you got to do this. So now it's teamwork. Here's the point. All of them have different personalities. All of them bring something unique to the table. But guess what? They all have stock in keeping the chickens alive. They all have responsibility. So we use their personality and what they're gifted at to make the thing go. And it flows smoothly. And they always do it. Except this morning. This one chalked up a chore trade this morning. They were all running late. We had pictures to take for the, new, for the website that we're updating here. And... And I realized the chickens weren't out. And then the chickens didn't get the memo of the time change. So they're like out there clucking and getting mad. And like, they're like ready to get out. I barely even got my hand out of the way. And those things are running out. So, so anyway, that's the thing about the body. There's different parts. There's different people, different personalities, different anointings, different giftings. But guess what? When we come up to the table, it's all for the greater good to grow the kingdom. Now let's look at the application for family. Okay, verse 9. 
Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. I love this one. Outdo one another in showing honor. Paul's a little competitive in his nature here. He's telling us to outdo one another in honor. <laughs> I'm going to out-honor you. I'm going to out-honor all of you. <laughs> Dare me. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Listen, this word hospitality goes way deeper than just having a meal or somebody over to your house for food. Like, hospitality here means that you've reached a level of maturity in Christianity and a level of love in your heart with Jesus in it that now you've moved beyond your own concerns and your own needs to care about somebody else's. Yeah. That's really what this means. It's like you're actually now going beyond you and worrying about other people. There's a verse in the Bible that says, be interested in the lives of others. We remind our girls of that constantly in youth and different people. Like, here's what it says. It says, to show hospitality. That is a sign of a mature believer who's now concerned about other people and other things. And it goes on to say in verse 14, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who, who weep. I want to I land on that, on that bless those who persecute you one. Really quick here. I had, a, I had a thing happening yesterday. Lowe's had this end of the season sale. All of their bushes were $1. I bought 28 Not realizing I had to go dig 28 holes. Before winter, I'm like, oh, that's a bummer. So I'm out digging these holes. Yes, have you guys seen the movie Holes? <laughs> Classic. So I'm out digging these holes, and I'm like, oh, man, it's muddy. Digging these holes, I hear all this yelling and commotion. And I look, and, and off in the distance, and one of our neighbors, this man is pushing this woman. And I'm like, I didn't think twice. I get on my four-wheeler, I zip over there, and I try to help. And I'm like, I'm like hey, do you need help? I'll call the police. And, and my old nature, and then, and then the guy starts cussing me out and calling me names and yelling at me. I'm like, hey, man, I'm only here to help. You obviously couldn't do this on your own peacefully. So I'm here to protect her if she needs protection. And um, so, so anyway, he starts cussing me, and he, he, he's in this vehicle still, and I'm like, the old nature, the old man, Aaron, he's like, come on, get out. Just, just come at me. Like, seriously, it's been, it's been about a decade since I've hit anybody in the face. But the new nature was there. The new man, the new creation stayed intact, stayed peaceful, stayed loving and kind. So, so then it's like then it's like I moved into twilight zone or something. And then, then the girl goes inside and comes out. And like this whole time I'm seeing this little boy in pajamas holding this teddy bear, like witnessing this. And it broke my heart. It really did. So then the grandparents come out, and they're grabbing this girl by the hair. It's an adult woman by the hair. Call, cussing at her, and then now they're all cussing at me, and they're calling me names that I don't even hear at the fire department, and I'm like, I'm out of here, like, and I'm like trying to leave, and then they come, and they're like, hey, well, nice to meet you, I'm like, nice to meet you too, like, if you don't need my help, I'm gone, and by this time, the man had left, and because and, I said, you either leave, I'm calling the cops, if you don't live here, you need to leave, so, so anyway, I'm just, I'm, I'm digging the holes, I'm finishing the holes, and, and I just, I just this, this thing was just was resonating in me. Bless those who persecute me. I just got called some of the worst names I've ever been called. I'm like, Lord, bless them. Encounter them. They need you right now. I don't know the underlying situation. I don't know the roots, but something's going on there. Your love needs to intervene. And I'm blessing them. And then a truck pulls in my driveway, and it was the man, one of the men there involved, uh, to apologize and say no hard feelings, wanted to know how I was. And that's what happens when you bless somebody. They come to the table to, to, to eat bread together. And now there's being light that's being shown. I was like, listen, I understand drama. I was only coming to help. And I would hope your grandson or your son would do that if, if, if ever needed. So let's, let's move on, though. We rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I was having lunch with my really good friend, Dale Christian, um, or coffee, with Dale Christian. He pastors uh, First Baptist Church in Troy, and good man, and he loves Jesus, and he loves to hunt, and that's probably the two greatest things in the world to me, so we get along well. Anyway, we're talking about hunting, and then he, we talk about, like, how are you? How are your relationships? How's your marriage? And he started opening up about a situation he was going through, and it brought him to this, to this verse, and he said it, it lifted this pressure off of him. And it's this amazing thing. And I just, I want to encourage you, like, you have a responsibility. And in the word, it even says, repay no one. It says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. 
The Bible talks about blessed, blessed are the peacemakers. Like you're called to be peacemakers. But there are times where Jesus even had to wipe his feet and move on. There's times where you have asked for forgiveness. There's times where you have done everything in your might, everything within your power to live peacefully, to, 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 to get rid of bitterness. And if somebody's just absolutely rejecting that, or if somebody's absolutely dangerous to be around, it's time you move on and you just be still and let God. Like, like here's the thing. It says, it says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably. Because there's another end of this relationship that it also, they have responsibility in it too. So I just want you to be free if you've done everything. If you rest easy at night, if there's some division in a relationship, and you've done everything within your might, within your power, within your wisdom, within your ability to do, to, to, to seek reconciliation or forgiveness or whatever the situation might be, now you get to live peaceably because you know you've done everything. Because that's the only thing within your might, within that depends on you. Okay, let's move on from there. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but live it to the wrath of God. Leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's another verse in the Bible that says, You never know when you're entertaining angels. It's saying if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy needs this, meet their need. If, if you're, like, if there's a table set before us in the presence of our enemies, why can't we love our family? I, I was talking to Chloe this week, and I said, I said, Chloe, I learned a long time ago, and I started praying, and I, God gave me this word, like, it's interesting that those who we love the most, we treat the worst. It's my heart, and my goal would be that the people I love the most get the best version of me. Never know when you're entertaining angels. Let me, let, me, let me close with this story. It's like, love your neighbor. Paul goes on to say in chapters 12, 13, 14, that, you know, the next one is how to honor government. The next section in 12 is then how to, how to put on Christ in love. And then 13, it goes on, and a couple, couple of sections after that, it's, it's this beautiful story and this application of what Paul's telling us. But it you never know, like, when you're entertaining an angel, and we're all part of this family. And it's like, people deserve to sit at your table. They're valuable. They're amazing. There's this fun story. I don't know if I shared it here or not. I think I'm reaching that age where I can't remember who I share what with. So you might start getting repeat stories these days, all right? I'll be 40 in a couple years, so, you know. That's either going to make you feel really young or really old right now. My apologies. My grandpa was a really kind, really godly, awesome, pure man. One of the things I'm proud of is I'm a third-generation pastor, once atheist, now pastor, third-generation pastor, but there's never been a financial or sexual scandal in any of my dad or grandpa's ministries with any of his pastoral team or, or any of their actual ministries. I'm proud of that, and I'm proud to carry that legacy. That we've never, even in this church, we've never had a sexual immorality thing or financial thing. And, and that's, I love integrity and purity. And we make sure we have systems in place to prevent that. But my grandpa was a really kind man. And my, my grandma, my grandma was kind of like my sisters. <laughs> she was so fun and uh, outspoken and passionate. Kind of like my brother. Um, but anyway, she loved to shop. And... Um, so my grandpa, very, very, very quiet man, very um, inward, and just kind of sit around, listen to bluegrass or listen to, to different things and the reds. And my grandma, Dorsey! <laughs> That's kind of what you'd hear around their house. Dorsey, where are you? So, so anyway, they, my grandpa was driving, and I believe it happened in 25A between Troy and Piqua. And he's driving, and he, pitched up, he, he picked up a hitchhiker. And the man gets in the car and says... Hey, Dorsey, how you been? <laughs> you never know when you're entertaining angels. So he's like, wow, I never even shared my name. Who is this guy? I've never seen this guy before in my life. And um, he's like, I'm good. How are you? And just he, my grandpa was very loving. He would give anybody what they needed, would give his, his shirt off his back. He lived Romans 12. And, and then, I mean, they didn't go far, maybe a mile. And he's like, Dorsey, this is good enough. Thanks. Thanks so much. It's hospitality, right? Thanks. Drops him off. 
all of a sudden he's just gone, right? Physical, this, is, this was real. And about 20 years later, is that roughly about right? 10, 20 years later, a significant time later, my grandpa is in Florida. My grandma's shopping inside one of like the Beals outlets, I believe. And my grandpa's out on a bench, probably with his legs crossed, you know, sitting like this, just watching people, thinking. And that man, that same man who didn't age, came and sat next to him on the bench and says, how you been, Dorsey? And my grandpa was like, wow, it's an angel. And had this conversation, and they shared stories and just, just talked. And then by the time my grandma came out, he was gone. He walked away. You never know when you're entertaining angels. You know, and I, I just I felt like sharing that story today. First off, it's like, if we can love enemies and strangers from a distance, why can't we love our family up close? And there's something about unity at all costs. And there's something about fight to get unity and fight to keep it. We'd love to do communion. And uh, I'm going to ask the, the, the musicians to come or whoever. And I want to read one verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says this. When we bless the cup at the Lord's Supper, at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? This is kind of the summary of, of the message today. And this is going to get us into communion as a family. And I just want to repeat that. When we bless the cup of the Lord's table, he's calling us to a table. He's calling you to a table. Maybe it's a table to grow closer to your wife. Maybe it's a table with your children. Maybe it's a table with your grandchildren. Maybe it's a table with those who have persecuted you or, or been against you. Maybe it's a table with just people at upper room that you want to get closer to and invite them to lunch after church. He's inviting us all to this table, but more than anything, he's inviting this table with him to break bread with him, to host his presence, to be transformed in his very nature. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. So good. When we get this, all of a sudden, the people who are outside the church are going to want what's inside the church because they see the unity and the love. How will they know that you're my disciples? By the love you show one to another. The world has division. Families have division. Marriages have division. The church needs unity. God needs unity in his bride. And when we do that, all of a sudden, thousands will be added daily because we come into one mind in one accord and we're in agreement we're living with generosity with signs and wonders and we're flowing in the Holy Spirit hosting his presence and we actually genuinely love each other that's that's family and his presence transforms family no matter where you are no matter what you got going on